not the same. Thank you, Jesus. I search the world. It couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures of faith. Turn red. 
all those trades, Lord. They are unfair trades, but in our favor, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You can be seated. Amen. We will continue with worship after the message during our response time, but I just want to take a moment and welcome you to Silver Creek Fellowship. It is so good to be together here today. Uh, my family and I were on vacation uh, over the last week, and prior to that, we had a church camp out, and prior to that, I was in Poland. I realized I've been home in my own bed three days in the month of June, so I am so glad to be here with you guys all this weekend, be gathered together as a church family. Uh, it is truly no place on earth that I would rather be than here with this family uh, in this community doing what God's called us together to do. This will be a great time in your service for you to fill out your connection card. If you're watching online, you can fill out a connection card there as well. Don't forget the backside has a spot for your prayer requests and your answers to prayer. We will gather together this week, 6.30 a.m. We'll pray through each and every one of these, so I want to encourage you, take the time to fill those out. And then we got bins that are there on the back wall or out in the entryway that you can drop these in after the service. Now, if you came prepared to give tithes or offerings today, those same bins are what you can use to put your uh, tithes in. And you can also do that in a ton of different ways. You can see on the board behind me, we have lots of different ways for you to get engaged in giving, to get that set up automatic, or to do it uh, each week, or to do it however you decide. We've got lots of tools available for you. If you need help with any of that, just stop by the info desk after the service. Uh, we would love to be able to help you with that. Now, I'm excited to tell you this next Saturday, remember, it seems like a long time ago, but I began telling you, mark your calendar because summertime gets busy and July 16th is going to be a date you don't want to miss. This is called Serve Day, and it's the first time we as a church are actually participating in a huge national event called Serve Day, where local churches take on their communities and serve in tons of different ways all over our town. On that day, if you already have your purple shirt, great, wear it. If you don't, when you come here at 9 a.m. on Saturday morning, we will get you one of the SCF purple t-shirts. And the goal is that we would cover this community with the heart of Jesus to be the hands and feet of our Lord and Savior to bless and serve the people of our town. We have a ton of projects that we are going to tackle on that day, but here's the thing that's missing. You. Serve day is when we, the church, together serve in our community. So it doesn't happen without you. So this next Saturday at 9, we're going to meet here. We'll have donuts and coffee together. We'll pray together, and then out to our projects we will go. This week, you will receive an email with a text attached to it for a chance to sign up to be part of some of these projects. Now, you may not know which one you want to be a part of. You might just say, hey, put me on any project, and that's just fine. But here's the catch. If you're not in our system, you will not receive the email to sign up for projects. So here's what I'd ask of you today. If you want to help us on Serve Day, go out and be a blessing in our community. We've got landscape projects. We've got a free car wash at Napa. We've got delivering stuff out to the police and the fire departments and the nurses. We have uh, making flower arrangements for shut-ins. We've got hosting an estate sale for a, a man that's in hospice care. We have tons of different projects that we're going to be doing. And we need your help. So when you get that email this week, please sign up. And if you haven't been in our system yet, fill out a card today and just write on there, Serve Day. I want to help with Serve Day. Make sure you give us your email because that's how we'll be sending out the thing for you to sign up this week for a project. So if you're not, haven't done that before, just fill out a card today, write Serve Day on that, and we'll make sure that you get invited to join us this Saturday we're meeting here at 9 a.m. All projects will meet here first and we'll be done. Our goal is to be finished with our projects by noon. That doesn't mean every project will be done at noon. It just means that's the time frame that we're shooting for to complete these projects inside of. Okay, everyone got it? Okay, that's wonderful. All right, now 
Another thing that I'm excited to have with us today is recently this church, Silver Creek Fellowship, took on a project, another way to serve in our local community at the Union Gospel Mission Simonka House. We have a short video we'd like to show you from that project. Hope and is actually, everything. Hope there is it goes. Everything. Hope is everything. Hope is God. Hope is his promises. Hope is what he has for us in the future. Hope is changing our lives, transforming us into his image. Kathy, why is this in, such a special thing to have partnerships like this? Well, we can't do the work that we have to do all on our own. And this isn't just our work either, it's right. God's work. And so he brings us all together uh, to do this, to do the work together. Uh, and it means so much to the women. They can't believe, they cannot believe that people in our community care so much about them that they come and they spend not only money but the time and these ladies are going to be spending quite a bit of time <laughs> in this project yeah and i want to say also that silver creek fellowship had taken an offering at christmas time for the season of blessing and it was so awesome to send our proposal to the church and have the funds already there. So for all the people that contributed to that, it's really, I, I want you to know that it's really going to bless many. And, and it was such, it was just so awesome to have it available. can't even hardly talk about it without getting a little bit. Um, I'm excited to tell you actually today, Kathy Smith, the director of the Women's Ministries at Union Gospel Mission is actually with us today. So Kathy, why don't you come on up and say uh, something to church? Why don't we welcome Kathy this morning? Well, thank you. It's just absolutely wonderful to be here and to see all of your faces. The, the, the joy that this project brought to the women in-house uh, during the process and now even continues to today. You know, I, I, I set it up there, and I don't know any other better way to say why it's so important that we all work together to serve these women and children at Samanka Place. And it's really because... Like Pastor said, we're the hands and feet of Jesus. We are his voice today. And every time that you as a church member, a community member, comes into our facility and spends time with these women, gives your time to these women and these children, you are an expression of God's love. And it changes their lives. I'll just tell you that in the last 10 months, over 100 women and 35 children are now in their own homes, permanent homes, because of your support Amen. and the work that you have done to um, build them up to be able to move out and to be able to move forward in their lives and to maintain those homes. They make connections with you. They make connections with their community people who are going to be out there to support them long after they've left Samanka Place. And so thank you. Thank you so much for letting God use you and work through you at our facility. It changes lives. Amen. Amen. Amen is right. God has made some wonderful partnerships, and I say that on purpose 
the fact that Mark Hunter, um, one of our members who leads our small group program, works full-time such an integral part at Union Gospel Mission, and God just been knitting that relationship more and more. I'm excited to see what's next. Honestly, I'm excited to see the next step in this relationship that God has. Let's keep praying for Union Gospel. Let's keep volunteering. Let's keep giving. Let's keep uh, being a part of this because God's doing a wonderful thing to bless people whom He dearly loves um, through the Union Gospel Mission. Now, as I said, we're going to jump in here today. My family just spent this last week in California. We visited Universal Studios, Knott's Berry Farm, Disneyland, and we had an absolutely wonderful trip. Now, I always say there are two kinds of people in this world. There are Disney people, and there's everyone else who's wrong. One of the things that made Disneyland so special for us is that for more than almost 70 years, the Walt Disney Company has really been living off of Walt's original dream and his passion to provide a truly unique experience for each and every member of the family. And when you can see it in the smallest details on display throughout the Disney uh, world, they have the way the staff looks, the way that you're greeted when you walk into a facility, the way the place is kept clean despite the fact that it's packed shoulder to shoulder with people, and they do this day in and day out, seven days a week, and absolutely everything they do is quality. Now, one perfect example of this is a few different times when the crowds are really heavy in the evening and the electrical parade is about to begin and the fireworks, everyone's packed into the main street area. They open up these back uh, uh, paths for you to go backstage so that you can cut from the back of the park to the front without going down through the crowd. What amazed us is even these backstage areas are highly themed and decorated so that just in case when you're backstage and look up, you won't notice an air conditioner or a garbage can or something they don't want you to see. There's, they absolutely think of everything, and it's amazing. See, Walt Disney once said, whatever you do, do it well. Do it so well that when people see you do it, they'll want to come back and see you do it again. And then they'll want to bring others to show them how well you do what you do. You see, that was Walt's passion, to do things exceptionally well. And today, I want to talk to you all about passion. Because, see, I believe that nothing great is ever accomplished in this world, in our lives, without passion. Nothing can be sustained in this life without passion passion. Without passion, life is boring. It becomes monotonous. It becomes routine. It becomes dull. The great poet John Bon Jovi once said, I thought I'd try to fly that one past you, <clears throat> nothing is as important as passion. No matter what you do with your life, be passionate. Now, we have a story in the Bible about a day where a man walked up to Jesus and said, Jesus, what is the most important commandment in all of Scripture? Now, isn't it amazing that we have this question and Jesus' answer? I mean, what a wonderful thing for us to have. We don't have to wonder. We don't have to guess. We don't have to make up an answer for ourselves. Jesus actually answered for us the question, what is the most important thing in Scripture? What's the most important thing in the Bible? And here's how Jesus answered it in Matthew 22, 37 and 38. Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Jesus says this is the number one commandment thing in life. Jesus says the most important thing for you and I to get is for us to love God passionately with all that we have. He says nothing in life matters more than this. According to Jesus, this is the first and most important thing. God does not want us to live life half-heartedly and to love him half-heartedly. He wants us to love him with all our heart, 
soul, mind, and strength. I love Eugene Peterson's paraphrase of this verse from the Message Bible. He says in Mark 11.30, he says it like this. Jesus said, Love the Lord your God with all your passion and prayer and intelligence and energy. See, that word passion in the Greek is the word heart. God is saying, I want you to put some muscle into our relationship. Put some energy into it. Put some emotion into it into your relationship with me. Don't be half-hearted. And in fact, this is not a unique teaching. Scripture holds this up over and over again. Paul says to the church in Colossae, in Colossians 3, 23, whatever you do, do it with all your heart as unto the Lord and not unto men. He says, I want you to live passionately. Whatever you do, do it with all your heart as if you're serving and loving God. See, God did not design us, friends, to live a passionless, half-hearted life. But here's where we come up against our culture. In our country, in the West, in America, it is okay to be passionate about absolutely anything except for God. It's not culturally or politically correct for us to be passionate in our faith. We can be passionate about movies. Anyone passionate about movies or have a friend that wants to tell you about all the movies they watch, right? We can be passionate about movies. We can be passionate about sports. Anyone, right? You, you got to talk it. You got to talk trades. You got to talk deals. You got to talk deadlines. You got to talk scores. You got to keep up with the stats. You're constantly talking and evangelizing sports. We can be passionate about Disney. Uh, I can tell you some stories. Some people are really passionate about Disney. We saw some tattoos in Disneyland that I, blew my mind. And I thought, that's a lot of passion right there. You can be passionate about politics in our era. You can be passionate about fashion and clothing. You can be passionate about restaurants. Some of us obviously are. But in our culture, the big no-no these days is to be passionate about our faith. In our culture, it's okay to be passionate about anything and everything else except your relationship with God. That's personal. That's private. I don't want to hear about that. That's a you thing, not an us thing. Share with me anything else in your life. But please, keep your faith to yourself. I can go to a sporting event, and I can shout so long and so loud that I literally lose my voice. I can show up to work the next day on Monday and without being able to speak, say, oh, well, I went to the Seahawks game, and they'd say, oh, yeah, he's a fan. But imagine showing up to work on Monday after losing your voice and explaining, I went to church yesterday, and I sang and praised so much that I lost my voice. If we do it at a game, we're a fan. If we do it in church, we're a fanatic. If we do it at the stadium, we love our team. If we do it outside in the, the realm of our faith, we're a nutcase. We don't want to get too emotional about our faith. It's best to keep a level temperament when it comes to our faith. It's okay for anything and everything else. Just type into Google a passion for. It's amazing what people are passionate about. Romans 12, 11 tells us Christians, though, to never be lacking in zeal, but to keep our spiritual fervor. Notice that it uses the word keep. What does that mean to you? When it says keep, it means it's not automatic. It's not something that happens by chance. It's a choice. It's a discipline. It's something that we must maintain. It's something that we have to choose to do. And it's something that our culture and our world is trying constantly to distract us away from. Our culture is looking for ways to steal your passion, to steal your zeal, to put you on simmer so that you don't live a passionate life for the Lord. Listen, I don't believe passion for God has anything to do with your personality and anything to do with your age. 
Silver Creek Fellowship is made up of a vast diversity of people's age and personality types. And I've seen people who are inverted live passionate lives for the Lord. I've seen people who are elderly living passion-filled lives for the Lord. This isn't a thing about youth. This isn't a thing about the young. This is a problem that we must address, church, about living this lukewarm lifestyle for God. So here's what I want to do with you today. I want to look at some things that rob our passion. I want to look at some passion killers, some things that actually are working against you right now to keep you living a lukewarm life towards God, okay? So here is the first one, and this one may be hard for some of us. They're all going to be, by the way. Number one, an unbalanced schedule. An unbalanced schedule. That means you are either overworked or underworked. Because you're going to lose your passion in life and your passion for God either way. The Bible teaches us that life is a series of seasons. The Bible says there's a season for everything. And you all know there are seasons of life where you really stay up late. You work long hours. You've got newborn kids. You're constantly at the grindstone. But that cannot be the season that you stay in for all your life. We need seasons of rest and we need seasons of work. And too much of either one of those things will sap you and drain you of your passion. Too much work will cause you to burn out. Too much boredom will cause you to just drift away. My guess is, in a group our size, there are some of you in here that need to work less, and there's some of you in here that need to work or serve more. We're all different in our capacity, and our personality, and we can be pulled to either extreme. But if you're grinding, if you're working constantly, if you're never giving yourself a break, listen to Psalm 127.2. In fact, I'd recommend that you write this verse down, that you circle it. I'm going to give it to you from the Living Bible today, but look it up in as many translations this week as you can. If this is an issue for you, listen to what it says. It says it's senseless. For you to work so hard from early morning until late at night, fearing that you're going to starve to death, for God wants his loved ones to get their proper rest. God wants his loved ones to get their proper rest. You may need to uh, laminate that. You may need to stick it on your dashboard or on your refrigerator. But this is important truth from Scripture, that God wants his loved ones to get their proper rest. See, some of you, your problem is you're always giving. You're always giving out. You're always helping. You're always the first one to volunteer. You're always the first one to serve. You're always the first one to show up. You're the one known for being the first one at work in the morning and the last one there in the evening. And you're never taking the time to rest and recharge. You have an unbalanced life and an unbalanced schedule. And here's what will happen. You will burn out. You will burn out. My dad says that some of you burn the candle on both ends, but you're not as bright as you think you are. See, others of you are here, you're the opposite. You're always taking in, but seldom giving out. You go to every Bible study you can. You listen to every teacher and every podcast. You go to seminars, you go to Christian concerts, you go to workshops. You're at church every time we open the doors. You're always learning. You have a PhD level understanding of Scripture but no place to serve and no place to give. You don't have ministry. You don't have mission. You're just taking in food without any output. And what happens when we take in a whole bunch without any output? We get fat. So we get fat and fatter and fatter until pretty soon we got to roll you down the aisle to get you out. This is where the term holy roller comes in. So what's the antidote for that? What's the antidote? What do we do about this? 1 Timothy 4, 7 is the antidote. It tells us, says this, don't waste time arguing over foolish ideas and silly myths and legends. Spend your time and energy in the exercise of keeping spiritually fit. The exercise of keeping spiritually fit. So how do we do that? Well, One word, and it's actually, 
If you're here today and you need some uh, physical tools to help you with balance and health, uh, I gave away the word, shoot. If you need some, a word that's going to help you with your health physically or spiritually, it's balance. Balance is the key. To be physically fit, you have to have a balanced diet. To be spiritually fit, you have to have balance in your spiritual disciplines, in your spiritual habits. Now, if you've been coming to Silver Creek for any length of time, you will know that we talk a lot about what we call the five purposes that God has for your life. We have them out in the entryway, up on the wall, and we believe strongly that in order to live a healthy spiritual life, we need to have balance in all five of these purposes that God has for us. So we say the first purpose of every one of your lives is that we would worship God and that we would have time spent with God in worship. We say the second thing is you need to have time where you fellowship with other believers. Now I'm going to give you some insider understanding here. Insider baseball, we call this. In our step one class, what we do is we help people to join into the fellowship of the family of God, the local church. In step two, we look at the next habit, which is discipleship, which is learning that you need to have times where you are growing as a believer. Reading the word, prayer, giving, small group, time spent where you're growing in your faith. In the next step, we talk about you needing to have areas where you're outputting and serving, where you're using the gifts that God's given you to give back and to serve, to be the hands and feet of Jesus. We talk about that in step three. And in step four, we talk about you needing to have an area where we call your mission, a place where you're sharing your faith with others. We need to have balance in all five of these purposes, to be worshiping God, to be fellowshipping with other believers, to be growing in our faith, to be serving and using our spiritual gifts, and to be sharing our faith with others. If we allow any one of those areas to get out of balance with the others, we become unhealthy. We begin to grow in an unhealthy way. All five are critical to our overall health. Here's number two, and this is a tough one. Number two is an unconfessed sin. This is a big one. Few things will rob you of your joy and rob you of your confidence and rob you of your passion more quickly than guilt. And here's how it usually works in me, at least, maybe you too with guilt. I don't often walk around thinking, man, I'm really sinning a lot right now in my life. I'm feeling very guilty. Usually, we rationalize it consciously, thinking, you know, it's okay. Everybody is doing this same stuff anyway. It's not that big a deal. You know, actually, my unique circumstances that I have actually justify my behavior and make it okay. But then subconsciously, it begins to eat at us. It begins to gnaw at us. Subconsciously, every time it gets quiet, that thing pops into your mind. Subconsciously, I promise you right now, that thing, that guilt trigger of yours, it's coming right now. It pops into your mind. See, guilt, unlike almost anything else, will rob you of your passion. David said in Psalm 38, verse 4, My guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. Verse 6, I am bowed down and I am brought low. Anyone beside me ever had a computer crash? Anyone? Some new update that it tells you you need to run or this virus that somehow makes its way in tries to write something in the wrong place and poof. Everything is gone. Guilt does that to us human beings. Some of you right now are in the midst of a personal system crash. And the truth is, you're trying hard to keep your joy. You're trying hard to keep your enthusiasm. But the guilt keeps crashing your system over and over 
and over again. And you can't figure out why you can't get out of these same stuck habits and routines. Fortunately, this is a problem that can be remedied rather quickly. You can do something about it, in fact, right now. Because Jesus has already done everything necessary to deal with our guilt. That's why, in fact, he came into this earth. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he, speaking of God, he can be trusted to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is his promise. All you have to do, friends, here today is say, God, I agree with you. This thing that I've been doing is a sin. What I've been doing is wrong. What I did was wrong. I agree with you. And I want to begin living my life the way you designed me to live. Would you free me from this guilt? I would encourage you right now, if you're one of those people that when it got quiet, felt a rush of guilt, I would encourage you right now, in the service, don't wait. Sometimes we carry guilt around for weeks or months or years. Sometimes we carry guilt around to punish ourselves because we feel like we're so sinful that we need to hold on to the guilt and shame of the thing that we've done. And friends, don't carry your guilt and shame around for even a second longer. The moment that you see guilt turn up like the check engine light on the some of you, this is not a good analogy. Some of you have been driving with your check engine light on for a long time. Maybe even put a sticker over the top of it. Don't do that when it comes to guilt. When the check engine light comes on and you start to feel that shame and guilt, examine yourself. Ask the Lord, ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you the source of it. Confess it before the Lord. Confess it to someone else. And the Bible says you will be healed. God wants to help you with this today, friend. Guilt can rob your passion. But you don't need to carry your guilt any longer. Jesus hung on the cross and your guilt and shame was put on him. And once and for all, it was dealt with forever. Number three. Number three is an unsupported lifestyle. Sometimes we can lose our passion for God because we're not spending time around anyone else that has a passion for God. We're not spending time with other believers, with other Christians. And I love this incredibly practical verse. The wisest man, human speaking, that ever lived, Solomon, said in Ecclesiastes 4, 9, and 10, two are better than one. Because if one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him. We need each other, friends. We all need will fall sometimes. We all will stumble sometime. We all need other people in our life. Human beings were designed by God in His nature to be relational. We were made to live in community, made to live together. In fact, in prison, when they want to give somebody the ultimate punishment while they're incarcerated, already separated away because of their crime, the ultimate punishment that we can give to a person is putting them in solitary confinement, separating them away from all other human contact because that is the ultimate suffering for the human uh, for God's design for us in our humanity. God created us to live together. But some of you Christians are living in solitary confinement by your own choosing. God made us to live together. God made us to live in relationship. I've seen a lot of people who have continued to live passionate lives for God. And I've also seen a lot of people, especially in this last season, who have lost much of their zeal for the Lord. And those who lose their passion for God often follow a very predictable pattern. In fact, this is where the pattern begins. The first thing that happens is they begin to draw back from their relationships with other people and other believers. Now, we justify it for lots of different reasons. 
We tell ourselves it's okay, it's just a season, we've got other things to do, I'll be back soon, I don't like their mask mandate. Whatever it is that we tell ourselves, we separate ourselves away and then become isolated. And let me just tell you, friends, when you become isolated, you become easy picking for the enemy. You no longer are supported by other believers and you are alone. And when you're alone, according to Ecclesiastes, you one of the other things that two are better at is keeping warm. When you're alone, you begin to get cold. You begin to feel far away from God. You begin to feel like God's far away from you. You begin to question whether or not your relationship and your passion for God was misplaced. If it was ever something that was really vital or important. Because the further away you get from other people, the further away you feel from God. It's a need, friends, in all of us to have each other. Hebrews 10, 24-25 says, Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together and let us encourage one another. Friends, it's so easy when we get isolated and alone, it is so easy for us to begin to deteriorate. And I don't want to see that happen to any of you. I want to see you continue to thrive and continue to grow. And sometimes, I'm just going to admit, friends, sometimes I don't have it. But One of the most encouraging things about being around God's people is somebody else can speak encouragement. Somebody else can speak truth. Somebody else can just put their arm around you. Somebody else can be praying for you. Somebody else can be aware of what you're going through. And that, friends, makes all the difference. Okay, number four. The last one. An undernourished spirit. An undernourished spirit will kill your passion. Because see, every day, you are going to face all kinds of different circumstances that conspire to shrink you and shrivel you and cause you to run away. I can promise you, you're going to get up tomorrow morning and everything is not going to go perfectly your way. There's going to be distractions. There's going to be disappointments. You're going to have conflict You're going to have changes. There's going to be challenges. You're going to have problems. You're going to have pressures. You're going to have frustration. You're going to have fear. You're going to have failure. You're going to have fatigue. All of this is going to be part of your day tomorrow. And what will happen if we aren't intentional about it is these things will cause us to shrivel and shrink in our spirit. So we have to intentionally feed and nourish our spirit. Because listen, friends, this is one of those things that nobody else can do for you. You have to willingly eat. You have to willingly consume what it is that God is trying to speak into your heart and into your life. How did we do it? Well, remember the five purposes we talked about a minute ago? For me, that's the starting point. For me, the starting point in making sure that I am nourishing my spirit, is for me to actually look and say and think, have I been spending time in worship? If not, here's what I would recommend. When you're feeling down, when you're feeling low, when you're feeling attacked, when you're feeling frustrated, if you have access to any kind, a a CD, MP3, Spotify, YouTube, whatever it is, put some worship music on. Feed your mind with some truth. Feed your spirit with some uplifting truth. Worship the Lord. Spend time with God in prayer. Don't just run away. Do something about it. Fight back with worship. Are you reading your Bibles? Are you spending time with the Lord in devotion? Are you spending time listening to God and trying to grow in your relationship with Him? Are you spending any time with other Christians? Are you fellowshipping? Are you connected to anybody else? Are you serving anywhere? Is everything coming in but nothing going out? Because that log jam can really cause an undernourished spirit. And 
Are we living our life so that our faith is on display so that people can see the gospel in and through us? If I'm feeling down and I'm really feeling like I'm edgy, I don't know if any of this happens to anyone but me, but where you're just irritated, where little things cause you to snap and you think, why why did I just react that way to that? I would suggest you go back to the five purposes, that you begin to evaluate Is my soul undernourished? And is there something that I need to do to feed my soul so that I can be healthy and balanced? Exodus 31.14, to me, is absolutely the pivot point in this message. I absolutely love this verse. And it actually starts with, where a passion for God should begin with all of us. Now, notice I put the beginning at the end of the message because this is what I want you all to take home today. I mean, all the rest has been fine, but this is what I want you to take home today. The reason that we are passionate about our relationship with God isn't just because Jesus said, this is what you should do. The reason we're passionate about our relationship with God is Exodus 31, 14. You must worship only the Lord. For he is a God who is passionate about his relationship with you. Friends, did you hear what the Bible just told us? That God is passionate about you. Did you know that? Did you know that God was passionate about you? That he's not going, oh yeah, there's another one of my creations next. He's passionate about you. He made you to love you. He created you for a purpose. Before he laid the foundation of the universe, he planned good works for you to walk in. He knows every hair that's numbered on your head. And that's a number constantly changing for some of us. He loves you. He's passionate about you. Band, you can come back up. As you think about God's love for you right now, I want us to take a moment to actually go back through in our mind a checklist of some of these passion killers and maybe renew this morning our commitment to God. Maybe for you it's an unbalanced schedule and you need to say to God, God, help me to begin to take in more and quit being so busy for you that I don't have any time in my schedule for you. Or maybe you need to say, God, help me stop taking in and help me do something for others. Maybe for others of you, it's an unconfessed sin. And just like I said before, just right now to the Lord, spend some time with Him. Tell Him, Jesus, thank you that you died for me. Thank you that you forgave me. Thank you that you take my shame and my guilt away. Maybe you find yourself unsupported. And so today you would pray, God, help me find Christian friends, people to share my life with. Maybe right now even you're being reminded about some Christian friends God's placed in your life that for whatever reason you've allowed those relationships to distance themselves. Maybe this would be a time that you would send a text message to somebody to just say, I love you. I'm thinking about you. I hope we can get together again soon. Maybe you're here today and that undernourished spirit is you and you just need to recommit yourself here this morning to following after and seeking after the Lord. See, our Father in heaven is passionate about you. He loves you. Psalm 107 says, Whoever is wise will remember these things and will think about the deep love of the Lord. 1 John 4, 9 through 10 says, God showed us how much he loved us by sending his only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. It's not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sin. Friends, I have to give you this warning. Revelation chapter 3, in the letters to the churches, God warns us about the danger of living a lukewarm lifestyle. He says, 
it's better that you be hot or cold. But because you are lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. We don't want to live lukewarm lives, friends. C.S. Lewis famously said, Christianity, if false, it's of no importance. But if it's true, it's of infinite importance. The only thing it can't be is moderately important. Moderately important, friends. How many of us are living our lives as if our faith was moderately important? If you found yourself becoming lukewarm, becoming stale, this would be a day, friends, right here, right now, today, that we could recommit to say, no, I don't want to live a lukewarm lifestyle. I want passion. I want fire. I want to fan into flame a passion for God's name in my life. I want to give everything I have to Him. That could be your prayer here today. So we're going to continue to worship now. And I would encourage you to stand as we do that. And we have several ways today that you could respond to this message. Maybe that sin thing that I talked about is something that really keeps coming back. Well, come to this cross, write it down, and leave it there. Maybe today you need a tangible reminder of just how much Jesus loves you. He loved you so much that he shed his blood and allowed his body to be broken. Come and take communion. And be reminded of the price that Jesus paid for you. We have communion here in the front and in the back. Gluten-free is there in the back only. Maybe today you're praying for somebody else, a family member, a friendship, fellowship, and you just are crying out to the Lord. Well, come and light a candle that represents that intercessory prayer. And then if you'd like to be prayed for by somebody in person today, we'll have people here in the front and also Joanne who's there in the back who would be happy to pray with you. Let's stand now as we respond to what the Lord is saying to us today.
of you, less of me. Thank you, God, that that's a prayer that you answer with a resounding yes. That more of you is available. That more of you is given. What we ask for, we will receive. That you're not holding our sin against us, but that you are here right now available to us. So God, I pray this week, as the Apostle Paul wrote to his protege and apprentice Timothy, I pray that we would fan into flame the gift, passion that's present in us. I pray that we wouldn't be casual about our spiritual lives. I pray that we wouldn't take you for granted. I pray that we would pursue you with everything we've got. I pray that we would thirst and hunger for more. Increase my hunger. Increase my thirst. Help us hunger and thirst after the right things. And help us to drink and eat deeply of everything that you have for us. We want more, God, because our city needs it. Our community needs it. A nourished, passionate people living the fruit of what we say we believe in the streets of the town that we live. Come and do it in us and through us. In Jesus' name, amen. Go in peace and be passionate about the Lord.